Westfield Memorial Hospital provides high-quality health care to residents of Western New York, offering patients the most sophisticated medical advancements while keeping the ease and familiarity of a community hospital. Support for Chautauqua Sunrise has been provided by WRFA 107.9 FM, Jamestown's public radio station, streaming online 24-7 at WRFALP.com. Low power to the people. Meter's Restaurant, a family tradition for over 50 years in downtown Ripley, is a proud supporter of Chautauqua Sunrise. Meter's provides all-day dining, banquet services, and custom catering specializing in pie. Funding for Chautauqua Sunrise is provided in part by the Chautauqua County Industrial Development Agency with offices in Jamestown and Dunkirk helping businesses to prosper throughout Chautauqua County. From supporting people with disabilities to enjoy great lives to providing health care services that are available to anyone, the Resource Center has been improving our county for more than 60 years. Learn more about how the Resource Center makes a positive difference in people's lives. Is getting vaccinated on your to-do list? We can help you check it off because we make getting vaccinated easy. You've got this because we've got you. To learn more, visit yougotthis.usaging.org. From the Access Chautauqua Studios in Mayville, it's Chautauqua Sunrise. Chautauqua Sunrise is hosted by Doc Hamels and supported by the award-winning volunteers at Access Chautauqua. We are here to share local news, colorful interviews, and events of interest to everyone. Chautauqua Sunrise is broadcast live Saturday mornings each week from 9 to 10 a.m. Send events via email or call us live. Check us out on YouTube and Facebook. And now, from the Access Chautauqua Studios, it's Chautauqua Sunrise. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Chautauqua Sunrise. I'm Doc Hamels, and so glad you could join us today. Good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. We've been, we've been picking up peoples and viewers from around the world, haven't we, Justin? We picked up Kenya and Michigan lately, and oh gosh, we're down in the Thailand, the Philippines, or over in Europe. So good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Hope you're all doing well. Got a great show in store for you. If you are a follower of the Curse of Oak Island, that uh, show on uh, the History Channel, they're coming up on their next season soon, but I have my colleague here today, uh, Jim McQuiston, and we're going to be talking about his new book that's going to have some more in-depth story and research of what happened up there in Nova Scotia and Oak Island, and uh, he's going to be sharing some things with you and us that uh, I don't think anybody ever has told anybody before, so it's going to be a really fun show, so stick around. Okay, so... We've got lots of things to talk about today. We've got some announcements and things like that. But before we do that, I want to remind you that this is a live show right now and that if you want to call in, you can call us at 716-753-5225. And if you have a question for Jim or you have an announcement, for instance, I want to do an announcement right now. I'm going to uh, wish my brother, Bob, and his beautiful wife, Peggy, Happy 50th anniversary. They just celebrated their anniversary yesterday. And uh, I got a little story to tell you about in a, in a second after I, 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 my other announcements. I'll get back to that in a minute. So if you have anything you want uh, to share with us, please do that. Also, let's see if I can do this. I never do this right, Justin. Uh, Chautauqua Sunrise at gmail.com. You can write to us during the week, send us a poster, let us know what's going on in your community. We cover all of Chautauqua County and even in down into Northwest Pennsylvania. So we're happy to do that. Well, Erie County Buffalo, we would cover a few things up there as well. So happy to share it. It's all free of charge. And uh, we want everybody to know what's going on throughout the area. I want to say good afternoon to my listeners on WRFA 107.9, low power to the people. Tuesdays at 1 o'clock. Thanks for checking in with us. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy the show as well. Even though you can't see us at the moment, you can hear us. And if you do want to see us, go to YouTube, look up Chautauqua Sunrise, 
put in McQuiston. That makes it easy. And then up pops uh, the, uh, today's uh, show, and you can watch. You can see what Jim looks like. Everybody knows what I look like. And, uh, you know, I hope you enjoy it. So, anyways, good afternoon, Jamestown. All right. According to what I, uh, I talked to Alexa this morning, she talks with me every morning. We have a little chat. Um, and I discovered, Justin, today's the last day of summer. I know. Seems hard to believe. What are you going to do to celebrate the last day of summer? Big party? I didn't get an invitation. What? Laundry. Laundry. Last day of summer, you're going to do laundry. All right. Gotta do it. <laughs> well, the weather is supposed to be a little iffy this morning from what I can tell, but the rest of the day looks really nice. And I think tomorrow's supposed to be pretty good. After that, we're going to get into the rainy season, which is what usually happens around here this time of year. Perfect for laundry. All right, just throw a little soap on your clothes and hang them up <laughs> on the line. So we're going to be sharing some things with you that maybe you can uh, do today and, uh, and so on. I, on my way out here, I was really shocked to see three different flocks of turkeys. So I know that it must be getting to be fall. It's that time of year. Hunting season is going to be starting up, so be, be aware of that. The other thing I want to remind you is that not only is it turkey season coming up, because they're flocking up or whatever that all means, but it's uh, grape harvest season too. And I mentioned this last week. Um, <clears throat> years ago, I actually was in a truck accident where I went off the road because I didn't see uh, a particular semi backing up across the road. And uh, it was the last second thing. It's a long story. But anyways, the point is, is that Trucks are coming and going, truck, uh, coming out of fields, and they're they're harvesting your grapes 24/7. So, with nobody's fault, okay, we'll just leave it there. Um, please be aware that that the farmers, our grape farmers, that are the, the the lifeblood of our communities here, along with other farmers, obviously. But w right now, it's their their season is grape harvest. So be aware that they're coming and going, and especially at night, look for their semis. Uh, and, you know, hopefully they're lighting things up and there's somebody out there helping out. All right. Um, <clears throat> my voice is a little, little scratchy this morning. I got to hang out last night in the Westfield uh, Cemetery. And I think last week, if you remember, That's not weird at all. it's not weird at all that I hang out in cemeteries. <laughs> I'm a ghoulish guy. I was uh, with the rest of the cast and uh, we saw some of them. Last week here on the show, Libby and Rick were out here promoting the program. Uh, the cemetery tour is a fundraiser for a few organizations over in Westfield. Basically, you buy your ticket, you can either get, do a carriage ride or you can walk. And I don't know, we probably had about 150 people or something like that. It was a lot of people last night. I know I did seven presentations. And uh, when you stand right on the grave of the person you're presenting, it's a very... Um, awesome responsibility to, to do it right and to bring that that person's life uh, in a way that's both entertaining but also historical and with great respect. So I had the honor, and I'll tell you now because um, by the time most people see this, it'll be over, but uh, I, I did Dr. Charles Edgar Welch, who was the founder of Welch's, and he, he had a colorful life. I mean, we used to think of this guy that maybe was selling grape juice, but he was a very, very interesting character, and if you're interested, I know that they're still selling tickets online. You got to go to Patterson, <clears throat> excuse me, the Patterson Library uh, website, and you can buy tickets. And I think you can just show up at the uh, uh, cemetery. But I'm telling you right now, from what I understand, they're be they're looking at the earlier shows. So I'm talking like five, five thirty, six o'clock, somewhere in there. So if you're interested in uh, going on the tour. It's really interesting. There's six different characters and you walk around the, the uh, cemetery with a guide and uh, they will uh, present uh, history and then the characters themselves come alive and, uh, and so on. So I had a great time last night. Really a very uh, nice group of people that were interacting with me and laughing and we were enjoying ourselves. So uh, Westfield Cemetery tour. Second time I've done that now. All right. I think that um, I am going to read some things here. So here we go. We're going to start with Infinity. Remember those guys? Those are the folks that work with young folks and, uh, and adults. Okay. And uh, they are seeking vendors for their holiday market, their art market. 
Seems hard to believe we're talking about the holidays already. I saw my first uh, Christmas commercial the other day. I think that was an all-time early one. <sighs> Calling all local artists and crafters. Infinity Visual and Performing Arts is seeking vendors for their holiday art market on Saturday, December 7th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Showcase your handmade goods, fine art, crafts at, th at this festive event. Experience this holiday shopping event in Jamestown downtown arts campus. Vendors will set up at the Infinity Center and Pearl City Clayhouse with foot traffic and back and forth across 2nd Street. So they, they're, you just kind of go between the two sites. This is a great opportunity to reach holiday shoppers and support local youth arts programming. Uh, vendor spots are filling fast, so apply today. For more information and to reserve your booth, just visit, here we go, there's the address, infinityperformingarts.org. One more time, infinityperformingarts.org. They want you to make this holiday season special with your creativity. And I'll tell you, uh, all my dealings with artists and musicians through this county over these years, uh, we're just burgeoning. We just have an unbelievable amount of folks that are very creative. All right. Not only is it the Christmas season coming up, but it's Halloween. 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 Spooky time. And this is called Oh, the Horror. Let's get that slide up. Woo! Are you ready to uncover the chilling true stories behind the world's most haunted objects? Join Greg and Dana Newkirk, Travel Channel's Kindred Spirits, Amazon Prime's Hellier, for an interactive presentation that will leave you on the edge of your seat. As two of the world's only full-time paranormal investigators, the Newkirks has spent their lives collecting and caring for cursed artifacts, possessed dolls, and other creepy artifacts set, uh, said to display supernatural activities. Now you can experience their spine-tingling true tales yourself. How would you like to go in their basement? <laughs> At a meet and greet with Dana and Greg, meet and greet includes having your photo taken with Greg and Dana, as well as your introduction into the Newkirk's secret society called the Sacred Order of the Haunted Object. I'm trying to see that Soho. Complete with membership pin. During the presentation, the New Kirks will take you on a journey through history, folklore, and true life accounts of encounters with objects that seem to possess a life of their own. Hmm. Learn the untold truth about famous cursed objects like the Crying Boy painting. Discover why the Dybbuk box, that's scary, I've seen it on TV, is scarier than the demon it's rumored in prison. And tag along as Greg and Dana reveal how they broke the curse of the Catskills crone. That's a new one on me. When is it? Where is it? October 11th, 7.30 at the Ridgeland A. All right. Of course, give them a call at the uh, box office and get your tickets. All right. <sighs> You'll even have the opportunity to help the Newkirks create a new haunted artifact. Live and in per oh I'm sorry, live and in person with just the power of your mind. This interactive stage presentation is a must-see event for everyone interested in the paranormal history or just looking for a good scare. Think about that, Justin. October 11th, Regiland A, be there. But make it a weekend at Jamestown with a second show, official site of the Nightscape Horror Festival, where Halloween and horror collide. Coming to the Northwest Arena in Jamestown on Saturday, October 12th. So Friday, go see the paranormal, and on the 12th, well, be prepared to be horrified. Featuring celebrities, over 50 vendors, workshops, live entertainment, film screenings, what's that say? Cosplay, co whatever that means. Cosplay, thank you. Cosplay, ghouls, a costume contest, kids' activities, and an official after party. Don't wait until it's too late. For a limited time, pre-sale tickets are only $15 each. Kids under 12 are free when accompanied by a ticket holding adult. Tickets are available online and pre-sale only. It will not be available at the venue on the day of the event. So go to the Northwest Arena uh, website and get your tickets. Wow, sounds like a fun uh, evening. So, October 11 and 12. Next. 
we have a course coming up here. It says here, Cornell University's College of Veterinary Medicine in New York FarmNet, in partnership with Rural Minds, we've talked about them a number of times here, has launched a free online course called Mental Health and Suicide Prevention in Rural America, designed to give learners practical support, strategies, and resources to navigate mental health challenges in rural communities. If you watch the show here with Jeff Witten, this is a, a very un, underserved area in rural America as far as mental health, okay? And these guys are doing their utmost best to help folks out there. Uh, suicide is got a it's very high percentage out there in, in the far reaches of our, our communities. Uh, Taylor for uh, veterinarians, agribusiness, professionals, and veterinary students, the course reviews specific mental health issues, including suicide in rural America, and provides information to mitigate them. All those with interest are welcome to access the course at eCornell. <clears throat> now here's a quote here. As a dairy farmer, I know firsthand that veterinarians are inter integral part of integral part of all rural communities, and they may be among the first to see warning signs that a client is experiencing a mental health challenge, but may not recognize those same signs in themselves, says Jeff Witten, a Cornell alum and founder and chairman of the Rural Minds, a nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to promoting mental health in rural America. Now listen, listen to this. Research has shown that rural communities have approximately 65% higher rates of suicide in their population compared to urban areas. Now, I find that amazing. Farmers are twice as likely than those in other occupations to die by suicide. A statistic likely exasperated by uh, financial instability and isolation. Rural community members also face barriers to care. Rural areas have 20% fewer primary care providers than urban areas. With 65% of rural counties lacking a psychiatrist, Furthermore, many rural community members have expensive or non-existent internet service and lack adequate health insurance coverage. Okay, so let me just see here if I have the actual time here. So if you want to know more information, go to ruralminds, all one word, dot org, and you can find out how to get involved with that workshop. So that's ruralminds.org, and uh, they'll tell you more about how to lock into that class. It's a free suicide prevention uh, course available for rural veterinarians and farm workers. Okay. All right. On a different note, let's go to slide 16. The Busti Fire Department Fall Festival. That's today, starting at 11 a.m. Get done with this show, head over to Busti. Busti Fireman's Grounds at uh, 3510 Lawson Road in Jamestown, New York. It is part of the first annual Fall Festival. So many things in the works. Listen to this. Kids Zone with bounce houses and many activities for kids, including Marty's Bubble Gum Machine. That sounds interesting. Two bands, uh, Porcelain Bus Drivers and the Whiskey Jack Band. Over 50 vendors so far. Food vendors galore, a cornhole tournament, beer tent, bonfire, and so much more in the works. Still accepting vendors and looking for sponsors at, the, at this very moment. So today, September 21, 11 o'clock, Bus Eye Fireman's Ground. Then, if you're still interested in bouncing around the county, Westfield Farmers and Artisans Market today, 9 a.m. till 2. Next week, 9 a.m. to 2. Where is it? Moore Park in East, uh, on East Main Street in Westfield, right near the uh, McClurg Mansion. It was voted number one in New York State as a farmer's market and artisan's market. Vegetables, eggs, meats, natural foods, and artisan crafts, and a whole lot more. And almost every, week, uh, every time they also have live music. <clears throat> okay, also coming up is a colored pencil workshop at the Ro uh, Roger Torrey Peterson Institute uh, tomorrow uh, at 1 p.m. Uh, okay, and join artist Robin Zephyrs Clark for a colored pencil workshop being held on Sunday, September 22. During this workshop, you will learn how to draw birds and amphibians using colored pencils. My birds don't usually look like birds, so maybe I should have a look at that workshop as well. All right, this next one kind of goes along with our, our other uh, announcements about uh, Halloween. This is the Gowanda's Historic Holiday, excuse me, Hollywood Theater, okay? It's called Paracon 24. 
and it's being presented and assisted by the Jamestown Paranormal Investigators. September 28th from 12 to 6 p.m. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> That's not what this says. Five dollar admission, all ages. Thirty nine West Main Street, London, New York. Thanks, Jeff. Bigfoot, UFOs, O's, ghosts and goblins, ghost hunting teams, Bigfoot researchers, UFO researcher, guest speakers, vendors, auctions, fifty fifty medium readings, and a whole lot more. Pete Weimer, who's been on the show, he's going to be presenting. I've seen Bigfoot dot com. There's going to be the uh, uh, something called Cookie Stringfellow, a UFO speaker, ghost hunters from uh, Jamestown Paranormal Investigators, spirit hunters in white noise, all proceeds. This is cool. They're, they're, it's a fundraiser for the Epilepsy Fund in the Hollywood Theater. Okay, so that's going to be next uh, Saturday up in Gowanda Historic Hollywood Theater. <coughs> 12 to 6. And finally, <clears throat> we have something coming up that's really, very really cool. We had the Sprout Film Festival Step Up for Autism celebration set for September 25. And basically, it's going to be at the uh, Reg Lanay, and it's a whole selection of special films uh, focusing on autism, and it's September 25th at 7 p.m. I highly, highly encourage you, if you're interested, have a look. It's going to be real interesting. It's being sponsored by our own uh, resource center. And there's going to be, uh, and it's free. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. There's going to be a raffle. There's a sweets auction, a basket raffle, all kinds of stuff. So it sounds like a great opportunity to for an evening on uh, the 25th, uh, Wednesday at 7 p.m. That's all I have for right now. So we're going to take a little breather, and Jim McQuiston can't wait to get on here and talk all about Oak Island. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Looks like it's done. Don't let salmonella get funky with your chicken. On average, one in six Americans will get a foodborne illness this year. You can't see these microbes, but they might be there. So learn the right temperature to cook each type of meat. Keep your family safe at foodsafety.gov. That's the first time I ever saw dancing microbes. <sighs> Thank you, Jeff, for, for that information. And yeah, you can get sick. All right. It's my pleasure to welcome back to Chautauqua Sunrise my colleague and friend, uh, James A. McQuiston, and uh, he and I have been working together on a variety of projects, but today the focus is on Jim more than myself. Uh, and so Jim, welcome back to the show. Well, thank you for having me. It's always fun to be here. <laughs> I know. Got a great crew here. Uh, I know. And Jim, you told me a number of times you were done writing books, no more books on Oak Island, and never say never, McQuiston. That's what I'm calling you now. <laughs> so you wrote Actually, it. Up. That's how this book starts. <laughs> never say yeah. never. What do we got the today? This is the latest. What, and, what's uh, the title of it? Well, let's do a close up on it's that. Oak Island and the Knights of Malta. Knights of Malta. Some. It's a subject no one's ever looked into before. And uh, what, I, I would like to say up front that because we were talking about this earlier, I've written eleven books now on Oak Island. It's not for the sake of writing a book, it's for the sake of protecting the information that we found out because I was finding a lot and then like five, maybe six books ago, you started chiming in. Oh, it's all my fault. And <laughs> yeah, and if you, if you uh, just, you know, you put the book out there, or I mean, if you only have a show like we have our Oak Island Plus or whatever, then all that information gets backed up on a hard drive and nobody ever hears about it again. So, uh, you know, you put it into a book, at least it's there. People can go buy it, people can have it in their library, pass it on to their kids or whatever. So how this book came about, um, we were, we had a show, Oak Island Plus, mm -hmm. but, um, we have it once a month, and I had ran into this guy up in Nova Scotia named Art Guinness, and he was sending me all these photos of walls and stone roads and everything, and his his implication was that these aren't just on Oak Island. They talk about them all the time on Oak Island, but they're everywhere out in the monkey weeds of 
Nova Scotia. So there was a big history and a lot of uh, buildings and whatever out there. And uh, he happened to find this, what he called the W-shaped wall. You'll remember that day. Cause yes, I do. I remember wall, that, the W. And, uh, and it was a stone wall built, you know, in a jagged shape like that. And uh, so he said the funny thing about this wall is that it can't just be debris from a, from a field, you know, clearing mm -hmm. it for, <clears throat> for crops. Because he said it's on a hillside, it's all mucky down below it. Yeah, there's no, nothing's tillable there. So they built that for some other purpose. And he said, and it does look down over this place called Port Medway. And right away I go, Medway, W wall, you, you spin a W around, you got an M, maybe it was made as an M to designate Port Medway. So we went on talking about all the other walls and everything. But then I got thinking about, well, what did Medway? What's the story behind Medway? It turns out it was Port Maltois which was French for the Maltese, or uh, Port of Malta or Port Maltese. And I'm like, wow, that's never been mentioned in, in any of the Oak Island shows. It's never, I've never read about it. I've read dozens and dozens of books on Nova Scotia. Never read anything about the Malta. So um, when you say Malta, what are we talking about? The well, island of Malta? Yeah, and uh, as it turns out, with just that, you went one way, I went another, and <laughs> Art went another, and pretty soon we had all this information about the Knights of Malta being in Nova Scotia. Not only in Nova Scotia, but in the waters around Oak Island. And uh, so um, it, w we thought, well, this is going to be a good show for our Oak Island Plus show. Turned out to be two episodes. <laughs> we had so much stuff, and we had stuff left over. And so, once again, it was staring me in the face that we've got two hour-long shows worth, and we have another pile that's never going to see the light of day, but I could put it all into a book and try to condense it down. So that's what I did, and that's how this book came about. It was to preserve all that work that you and, you and I and Art did. But basically, the bottom line is we found out that the Knights of Malta were leading the French effort to... Uh, hang on to Nova Scotia while the Scots were trying to, t you know, they, they named it Nova Scotia for New Scotland and they were building castles and fortresses and things like that and uh, so, the, so through a treaty, it's a complex situation, but through a treaty the French took it over but they had to oust these renegade Scots and they sent the Knights of Malta in. So you have the Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia, which was the Scottish guys, and you have the Knights of Malta in this foreign land that's pretty much desolate, the vast majority of it, going at it to, for the country, you know, to try to get the, you know, control of the country. And, and this was never, nobody ever talked about. It. And so on the Oak Island, they talk about uh, the Knights Templar all the time, and there's not one shred of evidence. There isn't one. I've never seen a shred of evidence that proves that Knights Templar were in America, let alone in Nova Scotia. But there's absolute proof because we named them by name. Yeah. We found uh, two absolute Maltese crosses. Everybody's familiar with that special, well actually it's right there on the front of the book, that special cross, Maltese cross. and. Uh, you know, everybody's kind of familiar with that design. Actually, it's used for a lot of ambulance services. Yeah, it's and, been around you know, forever. Because they were originally the hospitalers, which meant they built hospitals for people during the Crusades, mm -hmm. wounded uh, knights. And uh, so uh, we found two of them, absolutely, and then we found two that appear to be that, but it would take like a trained geologist or somebody to look at that stone and decipher it, you know, but, you know, we did a pretty good job, I think. <laughs> Jim, people are watching right now. We're li we live in Chautauqua County. We're, I don't know, 12, 14, 15 hours away from Nova Scotia. Why would anybody be interested in this story? Like you and I? Yeah. Well, what got me started was uh, my distant a uh, relative, his name is Sir Ian MacDonald McQuiston, and McQuiston is the Gaelic for McQuiston. 
he is the premier knight baronet of Nova Scotia. And I always knew that. I mean, I knew it since I was about 14 or 15, but I didn't know what it meant. I had no idea. And there was a phase where I actually emailed him a couple of times. But uh, uh, so I was watching, it was the third episode, or the third year of Curse of Oak Island. I hadn't watched the first two. And I started watching it for all the big equipment. You know, the, it was just so fascinating that they were tearing this island apart. They still are, by the way. Yeah, they yeah. still are. <laughs> They're not, not a stone unturned 14 times, I think, by now. Uh. So uh, I just was sitting there, and I thought, wow, Nova, our Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia, Oak Island, Nova Scotia, I wonder if they have anything to do with each other. So I actually wrote them and said, have you ever mm -hmm. found any of this information? No. Well, they called me for an hour. They asked a ton of questions. I started doing research search for them. I'd send it to them. They'd ask more questions. And it just got to where literally there's been hundreds of emails, which isn't hard to believe because you did a tally of our <laughs> emails for the last year and a half oh for the show. The hundreds and hundreds and well, hundreds. Well, not just the show, but the books you helped me with, yeah. too. There's 700 or 800. Because you find out stuff and you want to share it right away in case the other person right. can ping pong off ping, that ping, and ping, say, ping, I'll ping. look into that and see what I find. <laughs> well, check know. this out. Well, that was the way it was with them. And mostly it was with Doug Crow mm -hmm. from the show, uh, sometimes Rick. Um, and uh, so um, they said, well, after maybe 100 emails or more, a lady that used to work behind the scenes, she was like the mama of the whole situation up there nobody's ever known her you know through mm -hmm. tv they've never seen her. right behind the scenes she actually was in a split second in one <laughs> show and she didn't even know she was and they told her and she said you're kidding they had me in there and i said yeah you just walked by the camera <laughs> but uh she was a genius and uh she actually worked on the uh, uh nova scotia part of the movie um the titanic oh okay. that was her biggest claim to fame but she'd done a lot of other projects too so anyway she said, you know what, all this is just going to get lost. you got to write a book about it. Just stick out all our emails and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, make sense out of them, get them booked out. the first one. It continued on. She said the same thing about the second book. Well, then by the third book, I was getting so into this and was getting so much information. I, I said, I don't care whether they want me to write this next book. I'm writing it. <laughs> We're creating volumes of, yeah. of real history. And that's what we kind of pride ourselves. We say it all the time on our show. But... We look at actual documents. That's probably the driving force. Now, we look at family connections, who was mm -hmm. the son of who and whatever, but uh, we've been lucky to find some primary source documents, which means a contemporaneous letter or uh, a papal edict that was, or, or something that the king, you know, or the Privy Council minutes. Mm -hmm. That was happening at the time that the history was happening. We're talking 1600s here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and well, in fact, some of the papal bulls about the Templars and the, oh, and even the earlier. Knights of Malta yeah. went all the way back to what, 1312, I think. So, um, so, we, so we're thrilled when we find one of them, but we also find books that were written pretty much contemporaneous or maybe within a generation of when the event happened. Mm -hmm. And we've looked at... Uh, what they call First Nations there would be our Native Americans. Mi'kmaq, they call it First yeah. Nations, Mi'kmaq. In fact, you've done a lot of research on that, that someday we're going <laughs> to do something on that. I mean, we got research piled up everywhere. But uh, um, so we're, we're, it's actually the chore is not to find the information. The chore is to sort through the information to figure out how can you present this in a way to the people that makes sense in a logical way. We don't jump around. We're not doing quick head turnings <laughs> and, and leaving people with the suspense and all that. We're just saying, no hey, cliffhangers. <laughs> these are the facts, you okay. know, and here's where we got the facts. From. So, so let me go back to my question. So true or false, the history of Nova Scotia and the history of America are connected. Oh, yeah. Especially and, and, and that's why I think it's important. A lot of people don't realize this. Barbara and I just got back from Maine, and I saw names in roads and, and towns that had the names of the Scots 
of the British that went back to the 1600s. And I'm, as we're going through there, I'm, I'm, Barbara's probably, oh, really? And I'm going, look at this. This is, this is Arendelle, and this is Cromwell, and this is, this is, and we were only a few hours away from Nova Scotia. So Nova Scotia originally was sort of part of the United States, not, not the United States, because we weren't the states part then. Of the colonies. The colonies, yeah. right? Yeah. Am I right? Yeah, and then even after the revolution, it went on for a dozen or maybe three dozen years where they would uh, go back and forth. Does it belong to the United States? Does it belong to mm -hmm. Canada? Because when they drew the line, it physically landed in Canada, but a lot of the people were the same related people yeah. from New England, particularly from Cape Cod. It's kind of like they call them the Maritimes, from Cape Cod up around Boston and then on up into Maine and into Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. And why everybody wanted it was because it was kind of the gateway to everything. You came across from Europe, you could go up around Nova Scotia and go down the Gulf, or go up the Gulf, uh, the St. Lawrence River, and get up to Lake Ontario and Lake Erie and whatever. And Ripley. Yeah, and Ripley. <laughs> right down, right into Pennsylvania. And, and, yeah. and Northeast, where yeah, I live. Yeah. Or you could come around the front and go down to Cape Cod, and you could go all the way down to the Virginia colony. You could go down to uh, um, Bermuda and places like that where they were making rum. They were, they were taking goods down there and bringing rum and sugar and things like that mm -hmm. back up, you know, back and forth. So it was an absolute gateway and, and very valuable. So everybody wanted it. And that, that uh, we've kind of came to this conclusion that they have really strict treasure trove laws there. And when 2021 came along, that was their actually their 400th anniversary of the name of Nova Scotia, they never had any substantial celebration of it. And what it appears has happened is that there's been enough cultures there. You have the Mi'kmaq, you have the French, you have the Scots, you have the British, which is separate from the Scots. Mm -hmm. And uh, then other groups, particularly the Germans, came into Lunenburg and mm -hmm. the, and the uh, Irish came in, a lot of Irish came in. And so if you honor one, you know, you might be stepping on the other person's oh, yeah. culture. Yeah. Or if you start digging in your backyard, which you're not allowed to do there. You start digging in your backyard and you find some artifacts, it could be somebody else's culture that you're destroying, I guess you could say. And that's exactly what happened on Oak Island. They got shut down in 2021 over the find of Mi'kmaq items mm -hmm. near that stone road. Uh, right next to European artifacts, which led us to believe they were trading. They were trading beaver pelts there because that big beaver area there. But um, so they shut the whole island down. And I was up there. I got up there a couple of days after it happened. Two of the guys, uh, Craig and Marty, had left for back to Michigan, kind of mm -hmm. a little ticked off. And <laughs> Rick was down, everybody was down, and it was heavy COVID restrictions. Oh, I yeah. thought, yeah. oh, it's just COVID, everybody's just down from COVID. Nope, <laughs> they were down because they got shut down. Yeah. The only place they could dig, like Laird told us. Mm -hmm. We had Laird on the show, it was a great show. Yeah. I think it's top show ever. Oh gosh, yeah. Uh, 20 yeah. some thousand people. Yeah. And, uh, um, but he said that the only place they could dig was the money pit area, because it's been dug so many times that there can't possibly be any in situ, they call it, cultural items there. Yeah. In situ just means nobody's touched it in recent mm -hmm. years or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it, it could be in other areas. So um, it's gotten so restrictive that people in, in their own backyards can't dig. And we just did a show on, on the New Ross Castle, mm -hmm. and the people that own that said, if we accidentally find a really cool artifact and we tell somebody we're liable for an archaeological study which is about two thousand oh dollars and he, she said so what happens is nobody tells anybody yeah if they find it they say oh i'm gardening i'm doing some gardening and they have a little <laughs> oh, box they put it in you know but they don't they don't do anything that theirs are trying to protect Jim, i'd like to <clears throat> focus back on the knights of malta and let's let's roll the tape back a little bit <clears throat> So people got to imagine uh, North America, Nova Scotia area, and and it's a time of exploration, right? Absolutely. You got the Spanish going down into South America. You got the Portuguese all over the place, and and the 
I guess you say the Scots and the Brits, they wanted to get some of the action. Yep. And so they started getting into North America and into the Nova Scotia area. And so they had different explorers at some time, but then there was this guy named William Alexander, right? Yep. And he had a dream, and he created a group of guys, investors I call them, called the Knights Baronet. They have hardly ever talked about that, and we have reams of information about these guys, Knights Baronet. At the same time, and this is how we get to where we're getting to right now, you've got this other group of people that are being formed in France called the Knights of Malta. Right. Well, the Knights of Malta had already been found, but they were used to lead right. what was called the uh, 100 Associates. Right. And what happened was Alexander had formed his Knights Baronet in uh, 25, and two years later, Cardinal Richie Lou, which anybody reads Alexander Dumas books yeah. or anybody knows who he was, he was the right-hand man to Louis the Thirteenth. He formed an identical group. It was each group had a hundred men. Each group paid uh, three thousand uh, particular units of yeah. money for it. Pounds each whatever, one yeah. would get land. Uh, ultimately, get land. He just didn't call his knights. They were just called associates. Right. But he was following the lead of William Alexander, and so it came to a head over there because, it, 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 for one thing, there was, uh, again, I mentioned the beaver trade. It was incredible, and that was <coughs> a big, big business, but also lumber because. Oh, England those, had depleted their yeah, resources. It, it, they, between fires, uh, wars, building ships, building buildings, uh, burning it to keep warm. Uh, you know, it was terrible. And you look, go to Scotland now, there's the only tree far trees you see are usually tree farms. <laughs> Most of it's just barren. So when they saw this whole place where you can get all this lumber for free, <laughs> you know, and uh, so, and then they always had the, uh, you know, they were following the Spanish and Portuguese, hoping they were going to find El Dorado or something. Yeah. You know, they never oh, did. Oh. They did find some. Took them to get all the way over to Yukon uh, before they found the big mother load. But, uh, but, you know, they were always looking. In fact, the river that goes from Oak Island up to New Ross is called Gold River <laughs> for a reason. They, they pan for gold or however mm -hmm. they, uh, how sophisticated they got, I don't know. All right, so, so William Alexander, he names Nova Scotia, yes. Nova Scotia for New Scotland. New Scotland. And that's 1625 to what? Well, he, he, they got booted out in 1632 by the Knights of Malta. Why? Well, because Charles I of Britain yeah. was the brother-in-law of Louis XIII of France. He had married his sister. W along with the sister was supposed, to be was supposed to come a dowry. He only got half of it up front. Okay. Louis didn't have any money, so he couldn't pay it. And Charles didn't have any money, and he was desperate. So he made a deal with Louis that I'll give you back Nova Scotia if you give me that other half of the money. He gave Nova Scotia to France over a marriage? Yeah, and a half of a dowry. I think, so, I think France made out on that deal. Yeah. <laughs> For a while, anyways. And uh, so uh, the funny part about it was that, and we found this for our last Oak Island Plus show, that even by the very next year, the king met with Parliament and William Alexander and the Knights Baronet and said, don't worry, you're not being kicked out of Nova Scotia. And they're like, what do you mean? We just got kicked out of Nova Scotia. <laughs> and they've and invested they, millions of dollars yeah, at yeah, that point. Millions of dollars in our I own 15,000 acres in Nova Scotia. Now you're telling me it's not mine? And for centuries, all the way up to today, they've been trying to get some kind of compensation for it. In our show, we read, it, we read all the different episodes mm. that we could find where they would meet, they'd meet with Parliament, they'd meet at Edinburgh. So they're laying Nova claim to land in Nova Scotia to this day. Because as you read it in our episode, the the verification that they owned that land was about this long, and it covered every aspect that could possibly happen in history that that was their land. But whoops, it wasn't their land all of a sudden. So they've been fighting for it because, you know, that was probably a lot of that, uh, you know, it was a lot of chiefs from the clans and they were probably spending a good majority of the clans finances on it. Everybody wanted to get out of the old world. Okay. They literally did. There was, there were three popes 
At one point, three people claiming to be Pope. <laughs> there were the Black Death, which took what oh, uh, yeah. a third or two thirds, I think, there of was every a lot. European something. Millions like that. of people. Uh, there were fights over the who was king. You know, this cousin's fighting that guy, whatever. Uh, as resources dwindled. The clans were fighting each other. Clans that were had the same blood, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they there just wasn't enough to go around, you know. And it was just a terrible situation. William Alexander referred to it as vexations mm -hmm. of the old world, and they saw this land of opportunity, endless acreage, uh, uh, trees, you know, to build with. Okay, Nova Scotia is like. 95% stone. I mean, you go around that place. There's <laughs> That's true. rocks everywhere, so they can build a nice a castle or whatever pretty quickly. Okay. So, so the, the Alexander gets these guys to, to invest. The king marries the French girl and gives Nova Scotia to, back to France. And then what happens? So, how does the Knights of Malta play into all this? Well, the original group of French that went over there, they actually went over earlier than the Knights. They got there in uh, 1604. They were under the auspices of a knight of Malta who Richie Lou trust, entrusted with this project. This is before the Scots. Yeah, before the Scots. Woo. And uh, but it didn't it didn't uh, take solidly, and the English attacked them quite often, you know, trying to hold them back. And uh, so when it looked like the Scots were going to get a pretty firm foothold. Uh, they got another knight of Malta, Isaac de Rizzilli, and they sent him over, and he landed just below Mahone Bay, where Oak Island is, and that was his headquarters, or he actually built and what, a fort And when there. was this? He got there in 1632. 1632, yeah. Okay, and this, so he's charged the job to get the Scots out. Well, the original group, or the majority of the group, left on on their own because they were presented with uh, an edict from both kings. So he said, all right, well, the, you know. All right, so the Scots are told, yeah. you're out of here. So that was in April. But 50 of them stayed behind, roughly 50. And they said, no way. You know, we got, we got our, <laughs> this is our American dream. You're trying to take it away from us. So they actually raided a, a French uh, trading post to get their furs and get their food, whatever. And, and they were kind of like, it was like, I think you called it a, the Old West. It was like mm -hmm. the Old we yeah. West. There was no sheriff in town. <laughs> you know, everybody's doing what they had to do. And so Rosilli had a specific charge from uh, Cardinal Ritchie Lou, go get those Scots and get them out of there. Well, they finally, they came over with 300 men. So, the you know, these 50 guys, like, okay, we're going to die or we'll just go back <laughs> home. You know, the... They're always looking for the easier choice, and going back home was easier. So they provided a ship, and they sent them all back to Great Britain. And then they took total charge of Nova Scotia for a while. But it, but it was a peaceful transition. Yeah. Right? yeah. Well, and I think that one of the reasons it was peaceful was because they had no choice. I mean, when yeah. you're, if it's, what would that be, six to one, <laughs> 300 or, yeah, I guess. Yeah. You know, so you're like, okay, they're going to kill us. Or we'll get on their ship and go home. You know, did some of these Scots like like disappear into the woods? Well, actually, there were I think at least five families. They know their last name, their surname, mm -hmm. that stayed, and uh, they generally married into the Mi'kmaq, and so that was their sort of cover. Like, okay, I'm going to be peaceful. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm with the native mm -hmm. uh, group here, and yeah. just don't kill me, you know, type of <laughs> thing. But uh, so. So some Scots did, but when the, there were a lot of battles through those, like I'd say the next century, mm -hmm. but Britain took, re took control very strongly in 1749 and they established Halifax. And uh, at that point, there was no question. They had the greater forces. So now, you know, it's just basically who had the bigger army was what it came down to. And so ever since 17, roughly 1749, but in that, time span, they've controlled it, but, and there's been still battles with the French, and they actually uh, exported a lot of French, they call it the Acadian, uh, well, down into Louisiana, to Louisiana yeah. Yeah, 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 but, um, so, uh, it, it, but it didn't keep Knight's Baronet families from coming back, because once you could get back there, uh, first of all, the Halifax Masons 
we found their uh, roster, and it reads like the Knights of, of Bar or the Knights Baronet roster. Same exact names. Right. There was a Knight Baronet that was a governor of uh, of uh, Nova Scotia at one point. There was one that was the governor of Prince Edward Island, which is a fairly nice island just off the coast. And there was one of New Brunswick, which New Brunswick was broken off from Nova Scotia. And so they actually got their foot that far into the door coming back. And there was almost certainly a Knight of Malta, uh, seventh in line, or Knight of Nova Scotia, seventh in line uh, on Oak Island. He was the uncle of John Smith, one of the three guys that oh, dug yeah. up the money pit. So they were they weren't leaving it alone, and they were having these meetings in uh, Scotland with the king, saying, "You know, your your ancestor, who you got the throne from, told us we had this land, and we paid him all this money, and we want our land." And so you know, it's been an ongoing battle, and and uh, it it sounds like a conspiracy theory, but there seems like enough evidence that there has been a cover up that. Uh, they don't want, there's so many, so many millions of dollars involved, plus other people have settled on that land. So what do you do? Go to those people and say, hey, 400 years ago, somebody <laughs> owned this, so you got to get off now, you know? Some of it could be downtown Halifax. Yeah. I don't know, you know? And, yeah. and so uh, it, I read recently, and I wish I could find that source again, but it said that they had petitioned the British government and said there's a lot of barren land in Nova Scotia Give us a chunk of that at least yeah. to satisfy our yeah. our deed, and uh, that barren land is actually where our friend Art yeah. spent spent a lot of his time hiking, and he'd be like, "There's no any, there's no farms or anything around here, but look at this uh, stone road that goes up. There's a stone wall at the end of it." And he actually looked at lidar charts. He just did a bang up job of. Okay, so the you had the Knights Baronet, were, who were the Scots that tried to colonize Nova Scotia area, Anacostia Island, part of yep. south of Quebec, I think, and New Brunswick, and that whole area, right? And then, as Gordon, what we're saying here is then the, the land was given back to France, and these guys, these hundred gentlemen of that were investing in France there with uh, Cardinal Richelieu, <clears throat> he sends the Knights of Malta to, to be the strongmen, right? So what... In the book, are salient points. What did the, the Knights of Malta do? What you know, in did they colonize the area, or what? what did well, they do? their their leader, uh, Razzilli, he unfortunately passed just uh, four years later after he got there. But they they the first thing they did was drive the Scots out. Then they took over their communities. They actually, and we found this phenomenon where they wouldn't just move into their fort to tear their fort down, or actually they'd make them tear their fort down, right. and Burned they'd build them. their own fort mm -hmm. for some crazy reason. But uh, he explored all up and down. Now, first I have to say that Samuel de Champlain, which is a very common name, he was involved in all this too, but he wasn't a Knight of Malta, and because uh, he was born a Huguenot. Whether he can't change to Catholic or not, you have to be a Catholic to be a Knight of Malta. Uh, uh, he moved up to Quebec, and uh, so Rosilli, they actually appointed Rosilli as the lieutenant of all of it, lieutenant governor of the And he's of the, the French thing. Knight of Malta. But he comes over and says, I'm not going to try to step into Champlain's foot. He's, mm -hmm. he's you know, uh, famous throughout Euro Europe anyway, and he's he knows this like the back of his hand. So if he's willing to stay up in Quebec and French Canada, I'll just take Nova Scotia and and uh, you know look over Nova Scotia. But without his leadership, there's uh, the only other person that stands out too much is uh, well, there's two: Charles de Latour, the Latour family, mm -hmm. or his uh, Rosilli's lieutenant, Nicholas Dennis. Well, what's cool about Dennis? It's D E N Y S. He wrote a lot. So did Champlain, and so did Rosilli. But Denny's really wrote a lot, and he wrote about them going into the bay where Mahone Bay is, talking about islands, specifically telling stories about island, islands, going up to Gold River and actually checking the depth of it. And, and he said something about how far up it would be deep enough for a boat. Well, how would he know unless he went up that far? Right. So they were actually going up Gold River that heads to, right. to New So Orleans. if you're at the end of Gold River, 
right okay. at the very end, across the, the bay is Oak okay. Island. It come, you know, Gold River comes down on an angle based on the landscape of the mainland, and it comes right like this and wraps right around Oak Island. So if you were, for instance, he said that the, the Mi'kmaq would bring the furs down from up around New Ross, why go to another island? Why not go to the first island that you come to? You there come right down here, go right into the island. And actually, you know, I didn't think about this before, but I bet you, you could almost make a trajectory of that stone road that would run up Gold River. All right. So they come down there, they have a stone road, the big ships come in, they get a tender off the ship, a smaller boat, come up as far as they can, they bring the oxen out. Carmen Leg was on our show, he told us how they could be all the way up to their shoulders, didn't mm -hmm. bother an ox at all. So they go take them out, load up the, sh the carts with European cloth or beads or whatever, trading items. Food. Bring it up to the, <laughs> yeah, food. Bring it up to the stone road. And here come the Mi'kmaq with their canoes full of beaver pelts, right up to the stone road. On this side of, on this side of the stone road is where they found the Mi'kmaq stuff. And when I was up there, they had a giant dig. It was bigger than the stone road, but it went off on an angle. Mm -hmm. And right over here was all the, uh, the, remember there was a couple broken up barrels. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a trading weight. Uh, oh, the uh, 1632 T-square. Yep. Uh, that was uh, one of the, my favorite moments. I wasn't on the show that at that point, but they found a T-square in a swamp, which this is where the stone road is. And so I was just chomping at the bit because it was wooden for Craig to bring in the uh, carbon dates, because yeah. he does all the carbon mm. dating, or he, he's a go-between. Yeah. And uh, he, he, he's picking up all these items, blah, 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 then he picks up the T-square. <laughs> this goes back to 1632, <laughs> and they show everybody going, that's they, they, they had to go, and, and I'm like, ah, that's it's my right, year. It's right in the pocket of what we've been talking about. Yeah. So if I can summarize what I'm hearing you say is that <clears throat> Oak Island was sort of like a depot. Mm -hmm. It was a trading center. And that it wasn't necessarily, it could have been, but it wasn't necessarily for, for transport, this road wasn't for necessarily moving treasure, but it was used for utilitarian purposes. Yep. We even thought that the road could have been used for drying fish, right? Or drying the furs. Furs, I mean, they, they whatever. Would them out, you know? So, Jim, we, we're down to a couple minutes. So, I, I want you to tell folks why they would want to maybe read this book, how, where to find it, and just some key, key points in the book that, that are kind of cool. Well, you know, the, the, if you're interested in early uh, North American history or uh, knights, you know, uh, papal established knights like the Knights of Templar, Knights of Malta, mm -hmm. uh, but it tells history about Nova Scotia and, you know, which also relates to Oak Island that is not told anywhere else. Uh, Art found, he actually approached the uh, Knights of Malta of Canada got information. You got information. <laughs> you found that Hermstone yeah. uh, at the museum. I got information. So we have three guys uh, pulling information into one pool, trying to make sense of it. We had two museums help us out. Uh, you know, it, is, it wasn't just me, and I say that in the book. It wasn't just me. It was a team mm -hmm. that, that discovered this. And literally, you will not find this anywhere in the world. I don't care, you can look at any library anywhere, you will not find this information. Now, a lot of my books borderline on that, but nobody even ever mentioned the Knights of Malta on the show or anywhere until we found, well, right. until Art found the, the M wall, right. and then we took it from there. And uh, Where do you find this book? Uh, it's on Amazon, all my books are on Amazon under my name. Mm -hmm. I've, got a, I've got 11 Oak Island, and I have one on just the Knights, Templar, Knights of Malta, Freemasons. Mm -hmm and a bunch of other books too, but uh, they're all on there and I make them all the same size. So when you put them on your library shelf, you got 11 books, or if you want to buy other ones, uh, they all match and... Uh, Guess what? We're done. Okay. Well, I knew we, we could fill up the time. <laughs> Folks, I, I hope you, you enjoyed a little history and a, a look back in the past of, of this area. And remember, uh, the Oak Island story is also our story, as Jim has pointed out very eloquently. Jim, thanks for joining us today. And if you want to see more information, go to YouTube, look up Oak Island Plus, go to the Facebook page, Oak Island Plus, and you see a lot of Jim's work and my work and Art's work there as well. Uh, we're going to do this all again next Saturday, and uh, 
Have a lovely last day of summer, and we'll see you next fall. Take care now. Bye-bye.